Thank you for joining the AAN Virtual Resident Education Lecture Series. Today's topic is cerebrovascular events in pregnancy. We also have Dr. Daniel Weber here joining us to be our Q&A moderator. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Weber. Dr. Natalie Weathered is a Neurology Resident Program Director and a Clinical Assistant Professor in the Department of Neurology at the University of Washington School of Medicine, where she practices as a neurohospitalist. Dr. Weathered completed her Neurology Residency and Stroke Fellowship at the University of Utah, after which she moved to New York City for a Neurohospitalist Fellowship at Columbia University Medical Center. After completing her training, she accepted a faculty position at Weill Cornell Medicine, where she, where she received a wonderful mentorship as an associate program director of their residency. She then was honored by the offer to take over as program director at UW, and the rest, as they say, is history. Dr. Weathered greatly enjoys mentoring trainees and watching them grow in terms of clinical knowledge, clinical skills, and confidence. She has been awarded Teacher of the Year by her residents, which she holds as the greatest honor she has ever received. Outside of work, Dr. Weathered is a proud mother of two young children who bring joy and chaos into her life. She is fortunate to have a very supportive and adventurous husband, and together as a family, they love to explore the old growth forest near Seattle in search of fairies and gnomes. Dr. Weathered, thank you for joining us today. I am turning this over to you. Thank you for inviting me. I am very appreciative of, of the honor of speaking to all of you today. Um, you know, as my son is getting a little bit older, he's now five, uh, he's starting to question the existence of these fairies and gnomes that we take him on the hunts for, um, especially as we have yet to actually find some, as he, as he likes to point out to me. And my response to him is universally, you're simply not looking hard enough if you haven't found them. And I think that's a, probably a good philosophy for neurology in general. Certainly, if you hear hoofbeats, you should be thinking horses. You should be thinking horses for number one, two, and three. However, if you don't ever keep those zebras in the back of your mind, um, you're going to potentially miss some diagnoses. And let's be honest, there's probably more zebras in neurology than most other specialties. And that's probably a large part of what drew many of us to neurology in the first place. I wish I could tell you today that we're gonna talk about only zebras. Um, however, unfortunately, cerebrovascular events do occur in pregnancy, and hence we should have some confidence um, in knowing how to counsel these patients and how to treat them uh, when these events do occur. So let's get started. I think the best place really to start is actually just epidemiology. Um, and as kind of our baseline comparative group, let's talk about um, the epidemiology of stroke in the young, because this is kind of roughly similar um, uh, age group in terms of like women of childbearing age. And so stroke in the young has an incidence of an estimated 10 cases per 100,000 individuals. And compared to an older, perhaps more classical population um, that, that gets stroke, there tends to be greater variety in uh, underlying causes of stroke in a, in a young individual. So for example, you might be thinking of things like cerebral venous thrombosis um, as the cause, or ICH um, uh, might be a little bit more likely. Um, and even within the ischemic stroke um, subsection of stroke in the young, there's again, still greater variety in terms of underlying etiologies. Again, you might be thinking more likely carotid or vertebral dissection, or maybe even congenital cardiac uh, complications. Applications. Now, if our stroke in the young overall incidence is 10 in 1,000, I am sad to say that pregnancy-associated stroke incidence is approximately thrilled that, so an estimated 30 cases per 100,000 pregnancies. And again, when we break it down into stroke subtypes, um, these, uh, these um, uh, incidence uh, remains Quite, quite large, unfortunately. So ischemic stroke is occurring in approximately 12 per 100,000 pregnancies. Non-traumatic uh, hemorrhagic stroke is occurring at a fairly uh, similar rate, again, 12 per 100,000 pregnancies. And cerebral venous thrombosis is occurring in an estimated nine cases per 100,000 pregnancies. In terms of high-risk pregnancy groups, such as those with preeclampsia or hypertensive disorders of pregnancy, the risk of ischemic stroke or hemorrhagic stroke actually increases sixfold um, compared to pregnant women without these disorders. So again, pregnant women are more likely to have um, in, a, a stroke, whether that be ischemic or hemorrhagic, compared to their non-pregnant peers. Um, however, Preeclamptic um, patients or patients with hypertensive disorders of pregnancy are even more likely compared to the typical um, pregnant individual. And actually, the risk 
of um, increased uh, stroke uh, in the setting of preeclampsia or hypertensive disorders of pregnancy persists for many years beyond um, the childbearing stages uh, to the point or to the degree that in 2011, the American Heart Association um, and American Stroke Association guidelines actually began including pregnancy-induced hypertension and preeclampsia as major vascular risk factors for the duration of the woman's life if she had that um, event. Unfortunately, stroke and pregnancy does seem to be increasing in the United States, and over approximately a 20-year um, period, uh, comparing the mid-1990s to the early um, 2000s, uh, we saw uh, the rates of stroke um, increase by approximately 47% in the pregnant um, individual, and actually upwards of 83% in the postpartum um, individual. Essentially, all of this uh, does seem to be explained by the fact that there are increasing rates of hypertensive disorders of pregnancy um, and heart disease in pregnancy uh, also seems to be increasing. It's also possible that to some degree, um, we're just better at detecting um, strokes in these like less typical um, populations, but this certainly is not um, the only risk factor. In regards to within the pregnant uh, individuals, um, uh, pregnancy, the timing uh, within the pregnancy that carries the greatest risk, by the frank numbers, um, the antepartum and the peripartum um, time uh, seem to be uh, the, the, the greatest risk. However, when you consider that the postpartum period, which um, is also called the perperium, um, is such a shorter period of time, because really it's only for those first six weeks post-delivery that we see an increased risk of, of stroke. Um, the daily risk of stroke is actually greater in the postpartum risk compared to um, the, the, the pregnancy itself. Not surprisingly, the risk of stroke increases um, with maternal age, and this is likely accounted for in a large part by increasing rates of preeclampsia and hypertensive disorders um, in advanced maternal age, which is defined as um, any woman who's 35 or older as she is pregnant. Um, race and ethnicity also seems to play, uh, to play a role. So African-Americans have an increased risk of strokes um, compared to whites with an odds ratio of 1.5. And perhaps a little surprisingly, um, Hispanics may have a slightly lower um, rate compared to whites, at least according to um, the, the data that I was able to find. When we look at method of delivery, whether that be a vaginal or, or a C-section, having a C-section does seem to substantially increase the risk of either stroke or venous thrombosis. There may be some bias inherent in this um, observation though, because this was just an observational study, um, in that maybe the C-section's happening because the individual had a stroke or a venous sinus thrombosis. So, so there may be some bias inherent in that. However, you can also imagine that surgery itself uh, might uh, increase the risk of clotting due to the fact that it's causing um, more trauma to the body, which then often contributes to an inflammatory state, which then can um, lead to some clot formation. Um, this chart shows the breakdown of when within pregnancy or that postpartum state um, ischemic strokes are occurring. And Perhaps at least to me, more interesting than the etiologies that are listed off to the left is just is, is really kind of paying attention to the timing. And you can appreciate um, that strokes seem to be occurring largely in either the postpartum period or really those that are occurring in the antepartum period are doing so in the third trimester. So the end of pregnancy into that um, early postpartum um, period does seem to carry the ink, like the greatest risk of, um, of having an ischemic stroke. And um, here's a similar chart for hemorrhagic stroke, and you can appreciate that, again, still most of the hemorrhagic um, strokes that are occurring um, in pregnancy tend to do so in the postpartum period, maybe the very end of the third trimester. And the one exception here seems to be those individuals who have arterial venous uh, malformations, um, in which um, maybe uh, the second trimester might have a slight um, increased uh, risk during that time. Okay. So I think we've established that there are plenty of um, strokes, whether that be ischemic, hemorrhagic, or cerebral venous thrombosis that are occurring in pregnancy. And this risk does seem to be legitimate and fairly consistent across studies. But really, 
why is this happening? What is it about pregnancy that uh, increases the risk? And the truth is there's a lot of changes going on in that individual's body that might be contributing. And these changes um, are going to include hemodynamic changes that are occurring, as well as vascular and connective tissue changes and alterations in the coagulation cascade. And we can go through um, some of the alterations that are occurring one by one. So starting with some of the hemodynamic um, changes, we all know pregnancy is a state of high metabolic demand, right? The individual's body is putting in a lot of work and energy into forming an entirely new life form um, within your body and helping sustain its growth and maturation. That requires a lot of extra energy, um, and, and that's going to lead to some cha um, changes within the maternal um, circulation. So first, estrogen and other pregnancy protective um, hormones are known to stimulate renin early on in the pregnancy. And this leads to an increase in plasma volume, even like very early on in the first trimester. So first of all, we're dealing with hypervolemia. Second, cardiac output is also increasing concurrent with all of this. And actually by 24 weeks of, um, of, of uh, pregnancy, um, cardiac output has increased by almost 50% already. And that's going to continue to, to grow and increase, um, like as we progress towards the, um, to towards delivery, I suppose. And then third, venous stasis is occurring, and this is happening due to a combination of factors. So first, systemic vascular resistance um, is decreasing. Second, vena cava comp uh, compression is happening due to the actual just bulk of the uterus um, pressing on the vena cava. This is obviously most prominent while supine, but at the end stages of pregnancy, it's even going to happen when the individual is upright to some degree. And then third, honestly, she's not feeling very good, right? She's, um, she's feeling fatigue, she has physical discomfort, and so there's reduced um, physical activity as well, which uh, again is going to contribute to some venous um, stasis. Now combine this venous stasis with hypervolemia and increased circulatory um, demand and um, cardiac output, and really this is going to set the woman up um, for some circulatory complications. Um, concurrent with all these hemodynamic changes that are happening, we do have changes in the vascular and connective tissue um, system as well. So early in the pregnancy, in that first trimester, we're actually seeing increased vascular distensibility. And this is really as the hypo, uh, hypervolemia is, is starting to, to occur and to build up. However, later um, within the pregnancy, there is actually a reduction in collagen and elastin. And this leads to decreased um, distensibility. And you could kind of imagine the situation where you suddenly have your vessels become a little bit more stiff, rigid, um, et cetera, that then when you get hemodynamic um, stressors occurring, whether that become hypertension um, or, or other issues, that maybe this is contributing um, to the likelihood of perhaps especially developing like a hemorrhagic infarct or excuse me, hemorrhagic stroke, um, things like this. Maybe this makes these vessels prone to rupture. And concurrent with all of that, there's changes happening in the um, coagulation system. Now, I'm going to be the first to admit, I hate this chart. I can never remember it. This is that thing that I crammed into my mind every time before your test in medical school, and I'm still in that situation. So I'm not going to like delve into this like too much, but I, but I will summarize some of these changes that are happening. We do know that um, throughout pregnancy and in that um, postpartum state, there's a four to tenfold increase in thrombosis risk. Um, and this is due to the combination of increased hypercoagulability due to increased levels of procoagulant factors, which are all circled in red here. Um, and those procoagulant factors are factors 7, 9, 10, 12, 13, as well as fibrinogen and von Willebrand factor. So increased um, uh, uh, levels of procoagulant factors floating around your system and simultaneously, unfortunately, decreased anticoagulation um, factors. So there's a reduction in protein S um, as well as a reduction in antithrombin 3. And then in addition, in a third of women in their pregnancy, they will develop an acquired activated um, protein C resistance. So again, we have an increase in our procoagulants, a decrease in our anticoagulants. And on top of that, there's um, iron deficiency in most, um, not most, but at least many um, pregnant women, which is a procoagulant state. All of this is going to add up to the increased risk of developing a thrombus somewhere in your body.
Um, and so again, more likely to form clots um, and, and, and have then cerebrovascular events associated with this. A quick word of, a, a quick word on preeclampsia because we're going to be talking about preeclampsia a lot kind of throughout um, the day. So let's let's pause and actually just remind ourselves what this is. So preeclampsia refers to the new onset of hypertension, which is defined as a blood pressure greater than 140 over 90 and either proteinuria or significant and or organ dysfunction, which is usually liver abnormalities or maybe renal abnormalities. Um, Eclampsia refers to the occurrence of seizure in a woman with preeclampsia. So that's kind of the, the single identifying um, additional feature. Preeclampsia is strongly associated with strokes um, in pregnancy. So ischemic strokes in pregnancy and in pregnant women, 21 to 40%, 47% of women with ischemic strokes in pregnancy have preeclampsia. Um, and a very similar proportion of women with hemorrhagic strokes in pregnancy have preeclampsia. So this is a major risk factor for cerebrovascular events in pregnancy. Um, all of the clinical features that we see in preeclampsia really can be explained um, by just generalized endothelial dysfunction, um, including microangiopathy of, of target organs. Um, so for example, hypertension that we see um, as part of the definition of preeclampsia is actually thought to result from disturbed endothelial control of vascular tone. Um, proteinuria and edema. Um, so again, like oftentimes women are going to get edema within their, their lower extremities when they're preeclamptic. Uh, pre so again, proteinuria and edema are caused by increased vascular permeability. And the coagulopathy that we see um, with preeclampsia is really the result of abnormal endothelial expression of pro-coagulants. Um, I also want you to be mindful that preeclampsia can um, occur after delivery and the time frame is very similar to what we're, we're going to be talking about today. It's really that for six weeks after delivery that carries the highest risk of developing both cerebrovascular events, but also preeclampsia and there's probably a reason for that. So. At this point, we've had a discussion on the epidemiology of cerebrovascular events in pregnancy, as well as the timing within pregnancy that the, we are most likely to incur, uh, encounter these events. Um, and we have touched on some of the pathophysiology on why pregnancy may contribute to the development of cerebrovascular events. Let's now move on and actually talk about some of the conditions um, that we may encounter in the pregnant um, person. And I'm going to start by talking about posterior reversible encephalopathy syndrome, otherwise known as PRESS. Um, and as we probably all know, um, PRESS is characterized by reversible, very key, reversible brain edema that is related to generally, most often, relative hypertension, by which I mean a change from the individual's level, um, usual um, level of, of blood pressure. And it's thought to be related to failure of cerebral autoregulation as well as endothelial um, dysfunction. Edema is most classically seen within the parietal and occipital um, lobes. And while I'm sure many, if not all of us, have seen press um, involving atypical areas, maybe the brainstem, maybe the frontal or temporal lobes, maybe the spinal cord, um, this is actually really uncommon in obstetrical press. Obstetrical press really tends to read the book for us and, and involve the parietal and occipital lobes without much much involvement elsewhere. And you can imagine that due to the location of the edema, the symptoms are going to include headache. Again, you have edema in your brain, um, as well as visual symptoms because you have occipital lobe involvement, maybe some alternation from the parietal lobe involvement, and um, seizure is known to occur as well. Um, and press is associated with both hemorrhagic and ischemic strokes. This is true in obstetrical press. This is true outside of obstetrical press as well. Within the pregnant individual, there's a strong overlap, if not actual pathogenesis, but right now I can only confidently say overlap, um, between press and eclampsia. And there are two studies that, that kind of looked at this. So the first is a small single center um, retrospective cohort study that was done at the University of um, Mississippi. And they found that 46 of 47 um, individuals who had eclampsia had MRI findings consistent with press. Um, Let's see, a, uh, a, another study um, that was a prospective study done in Japan actually performed MRIs on 41 consecutive women who presented to their uh, institution um, with severe preeclampsia. And of these 41 individuals, um, they found press in 14% of cases. 
However, when they um, broke it down and started to look at um, which individuals either had eclampsia or went on to develop um, eclampsia, PRESS was found in 100% of um, those individuals' MRIs. So then they paused and said, okay, we probably don't need to be imaging every um, individual with severe preeclampsia if they're otherwise asymptomatic. And I, I forgot to comment on that. All of these individuals that had MRI, they were included regardless of whether or not they had um, symptoms. So let's say we have an asymptomatic, um, uh, an asymptomatic woman who has severe preeclampsia. Does she need an MRI? Maybe not. Let's think about like resource utilization. I think you can probably Wait. And of course, if she like something changes, she develops um, neurological symptoms, by all means, get that MRI, we're going to need it, right? But if she remains in symptomatic and her disease um, doesn't progress, I think it's probably okay to, to think about not doing an MRI. However, the authors found that the um, prediction or the predictoring factors um, that uh, seem to suggest when someone is going to go on to develop um, eclampsia rather than just severe preeclampsia included a combination of elevated diastolic pressure as well as elevated AST. So let's say now that you're seeing an asymptomatic patient who has severe preeclampsia, but she's qualifying for that diagnosis because she has elevated diastolic pressure and she has an elevated AST you may want to think about doing an MRI on that patient to see if you can catch any evidence of press. And then you're gonna to have to have a complicated um, discussion between the patient, the obstetrician and yourself on, all right, if I see press, do we wanna consider prophylactic um, uh, seizure medications or not? There would not be much data to support that, but it may be worth a consideration. Um, seizures are not very safe in the pregnant patient. Again, we're gonna hear that a couple of times <laughs> today as well. Um, so treatment uh, for obstetrical press is uh, typically aimed at blood pressure control, um, as we do for, for most cases of press, as well as treatment of seizures. Um, and it's worth just being aware of, because this is going to, of course, probably terrify um, the, 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 the patient and potentially the obstetrical team, um, that outcomes tend to be more uh, benign than in a non-obstetrical press. And this is probably due to the fact that um, individuals who develop press outside of a pregnant state, probably have underlying comorbidities that are more likely to be chronic, right? At least pregnancy, while well, it is certainly a high risk um, period of a uh, individual's life, um, it's still gonna be often time limited. Um, so, so outcomes can be good. Um, a similar, um, and, and probably truthfully related disease is reversible cerebrovasal constriction syndrome. And RCVS um, is uh, characterized by segmental narrowing with adjacent dilatation um, of intracranial arteries. And within any given individual, this often involves multiple arteries. Um, and it actually can also come and go over subsequent days to, to, to weeks. The clinical presentation is um, classically just this thunderclap headache that hits hard, it hits fast, and it's like maximal really at onset. Um, and it may or may not be associated with focal neurological symptoms. An estimated um, for 8 to 43%, just depending of um, the, on the trial that you're looking at, um, an estimated 8 to 43% of um, individuals with RCVS may also have neurological symptoms associated with this. Um, when that occurs, they may include visual changes. Um, and CGR is reported, though, not as common as it is with press. Um, RCVS probably occurs due to failure of regulation of cerebrovascular tone, and it's thought to be related to an alteration in serotonergic pathways with um, sympathetic overactivity. There are numerous triggers, as we are all aware, um, including exposure to multiple vasoactive medications, including some that we use quite frequently, so antidepressants, um, some uh, decongestants, tryptans, cannabis, nicotine, cocaine, methamphetamine. Um, Additionally, things like exposure to immunosuppressants um, can, can trigger uh, RCVS, um, as can uh, uncontrolled hypertension or head trauma or even sexual activity. Um, RCVS uh, can be associated with pregnancy, and when it does occur, it tends to occur in the postpartum state. So it's generally not like a during pregnancy event. Um, and RCVS is sometimes associated with um, preeclampsia, but the data is not quite as strong there uh, as, as it, um, the data is for many other um, causes related with preeclampsia. Uh, 
Treatment is aimed at avoidance of the precipitating agent, if you can uh, find it, as well as symptomatic treatment of headache and avoidance of physical exertion. And generally, for RCVS, both in a pregnant individual as well as um, outside of uh, it, the prognosis is good, um, unless ischemic stroke or ICH um, develops as a consequence of, of the RCVS. While recurrent RCVS is not common, it does happen. Um, and uh, in an effort to try to determine what the risk of recurrent RCVS is in patients who want to become pregnant, there's actually one small longitudinal follow-up study that was done in France that included some data kind of commenting on this. So in this study, they had 172 patients with RCVS, of whom 60 were of childbearing age. So notice that we're starting to already drop into pretty small numbers. And over the 10 year that these um, women were followed, so again, 60 women of childbearing age who had a prior history of RCVS, um, they were followed for 10 years. Um, those 60 individuals had a total of 16 pregnancies of which 11 of them were carried um, to term. So very small numbers, take this data with a slight grain of salt. Two of the infants were born to women who had previously had RCVS actually associated with pregnancy. Nine of the women um, had RCVS just outside of any um, pregnant state. Only one woman of the 11, so about 10%, had recurrent RCVS associated with pregnancy. And it actually was in someone who, who their prior event of RCVS was not in the pregnant state. So maybe there is some increased risk of um, recurrent RCVS in, uh, in pregnancy. However, I also really want to um, unfortunately highlight that two women who had had RCVS during pregnancy actually cited fear of recurrent RCVS as a reason that they induced abortion. So clearly when this does happen to an individual, it causes a lot of trauma. Understandably, this is a very uncomfortable and, and quite frankly, terrifying state, um, but, but, but be aware of that trauma and, and just try to address it head on if you're seeing someone with a prior history of RCVS. Let's talk about cerebral venous thrombosis. So cerebral venous thrombosis includes thromboses, um, both of the cerebral sinuses um, or uh, the cerebral veins. And um, these thromboses may result in venous congestion that can lead to cerebral edema via impaired venous outflow and can result then in a venous, um, in, in a hemorrhagic uh, venous infarct. It tends to occur most often in women um, or uh, individuals who are less than 50. Um, and risk factors actually most commonly um, uh, include the use of oral contraceptive pills. So approximately 54% of um, patients with um, CVT reported taking OCPs at the time of um, their onset. Um, thrombophilia is a known um, risk factor as well, whether that be genetic or acquired, such as like antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, maybe even nephrotic syndrome. Um, and included in this um, extensive list, honestly, of risk factors are uh, pregnancy and the proparium. So again, that postpartum um, state. Uh, within a pregnant individual, um, additional risks for developing cerebral venous thrombosis include um, cesarean delivery as well as preeclampsia and actually like a systemic infection, even something as mild as a UTI. Um, note that if um, cerebral venous thrombosis does occur in a pregnant woman, workup for thrombophilia should actually still be pursued, though you'd probably would um, opt to defer that until after um, she has uh, completed that six-week postpartum um, period, just because some of our testing does rely on, um, on uh, coagulation cascade factors that you don't want to be falsely uh, abnormal just because of the pregnant state. Treatment for cerebral venous thrombosis, even within the uh, pregnant woman, is still going to be aimed at anticoagulation. However, in the pregnant woman, you're going to opt to either use unfractionated heparin or more likely for at least long-term um, treatment, the low molecular weight heparin. Um, just being mindful that while uh, anticoagulation absolutely does uh, contribute to increased and additional bleeding during delivery itself, the benefits are thought to outweigh um, the, the, the risks of this bleeding. And generally your obstetricians are gonna be very um, supportive of, of, of treating the mother. 
Um, I want you to be aware as, as we're finding direct oral anticoagulants coming into more and more favor and as the treatment for cerebral venous thrombosis, um, that DOACs are not actually recommended in pregnancy or honestly, even the breastfeeding state. The reason being that DOACs are shown to um, cross the placenta. And so you worry about um, fetal effects um, if they were exposed to anticoagulants. Um, and for the breastfeeding state, we honestly just don't know um, real, like with any kind of um, confidence whether or not it gets into the breast milk. And if it does, does it get absorbed through the GI tract, et cetera? So DOACs are not, to, uh, are not meant to be used in pregnancy. What about now? Let's say you have a woman who has a prior history of um, cerebral venous thrombosis and she's thinking about getting pregnant and, and she's coming to you for counseling. What are you gonna say? We do have a couple studies providing some guidance on this. The first is actually a meta-analysis um, that uh, combined data from 13 observational um, studies that assess the frequency of recurrent cerebral venous thrombosis or systemic um, thrombosis in general in pregnant women with a prior history of CVT. And they found a fairly low but non-zero rate of, um, CV of recurrent CVT in nine cases per 100,000 pregnancies. There was a slightly higher rate of um, uh, recurrent non-cerebral, so systemic thromboses, at approximately 27 cases per 100,000 pregnancies. And when you compare either of these numbers or these um, rates to um, diseases in pregnant um, uh, women, um, within the general population. So again, pregnant women who just didn't have a prior history of CVT, not surprisingly, the relative risk of venous thrombosis is um, significantly higher in this population with the prior history of CVT because they've effectively already proven that they have the propensity to develop thrombosis like even before their pregnancy. I do want to throw one word of caution here, though, that when you look at these relative risks of, you know, 80 and 16, these do seem remarkably high. And the caveat here is that really this is such a rare disease, especially within um, the general population, but even within the pregnant woman without a prior history, that it doesn't take much in the, in the way of change to, to give us a remarkable increase in, in that number. Um, and then one significant limitation of the study to just be very mindful of is that this study did not actually include a comment on um, how often or the proportion of patients who were on prophylactic anticoagulation. So again, these are individuals with a prior history of cerebral venous thrombosis. Maybe their like high-risk OB um, decided that they wanted to prophylactically put them on anticoagulation. That's not controlled for at all in this um, observational study. In an effort to try to um, get a better answer in regards to that in particular, though, there was a study out of Italy um, that, that tried to look at this. And so this is a prospective single-centered um, study that tracked women of childbearing age who were sent to them for evaluation and management um, given a prior history of CVT. And in their study, 63 women became pregnant and they placed all of these women on prophylactic therapeutic um, low molecular weight heparin. And in this setting, they saw no recurrent cerebral venous thrombosis and only two lower extremity DVTs. Seems to be pretty effective at, pre at preventing um, these complications within, within pregnancy. However, they did find high rates of pregnancy complications, including 13% of patients um, had a, a miscarriage, and 19% of patients developed late obstetrical um, complications, including small for gestational age, preeclampsia, placental abruption, and stillbirth. They did further studies on these individuals that had miscarriage as well as the late obstetrical complications, and ultimately they ended up concluding um, that the complications were really more likely uh, to be related to an underlying thrombophilia with, consequential, um, with consequent placental dysfunction rather than the anticoagulation itself. So they concluded that anticoagulation does seem to be safe um, and probably effective um, at preventing recurrent um, cerebral venous thrombosis or systemic thrombosis in women with a prior history of CBT. All right. Let's shift gears and talk about hemorrhagic stroke. Causes of um, pregnancy-related cerebral hemorrhage are going to include preeclampsia, eclampsia, as well as hypertensive disorders of pregnancy. And this is going to be very obvious here just in a moment. Um, but you also are going to need to consider women with AVMs or aneurysms um, as potential other explanations for hemorrhage in a pregnant uh, individual. So 
um, let's talk about um, treatment of a hemorrhagic stroke due to either preeclampsia or hypertensive disorders of pregnancy. And really the key here is remembering that these are essentially just hypertensive hemorrhages, right? You're preeclamptic, you're hypertensive. You have a hypertensive disorder of pregnancy, clearly you're hypertensive. <laughs> um, so we're gonna essentially treat them very much the same as we do um, a regular hypertensive stroke. And there's gonna be only a few mild um, alterations in this in, in our typical approach, and I'm gonna highlight them here. So first, treatment's really geared towards blood pressure control, aiming for a systolic blood pressure of less than 160, like we typically do for these individuals. One caveat though, is it that if the, um, if the mother, the individual is still currently pregnant, she's in that antenatal um, period, you need to be a little bit careful about um, uh, not dropping the blood pressure too quickly because you need to be mindful that we've got to not only perfuse like the mother's brain, but we have to perfuse a placenta. You still have a fetus that's depending on mom. And so if you are able at all, try to try to gently bring her down while, of course, still protecting her, right? Um, uh, our first line agents in a pregnant individual are actually labetalol, hydralazine, and nifedipine. They, these might not be our typical go-to in other populations. Well, little beta lol probably still is, but the other two perhaps less so. Um, nicardipine can be used, but it's considered a second line agent when these um, initial medications uh, prove to be uh, insufficient. So nicardipine can still be used, but, but your first line really is gonna be little beta lol hydralazine and nifedipine. And you specifically are going to avoid ACE inhibitors as well as angiotensin, uh, angiotensin angiotensin receptor blockers. Um, and the reason why we're avoiding these is these are known to increase the risk of fetal kidney injury. They also contribute to the development of low amno amniotic fluid levels. So go to labetalol, hydralazine, nifedipine, avoid ACE inhibitors and arms. We all worry about radiation in pregnancy, and yet our first job, and this is going to be the theme of the rest of the talk, our first job is to take care of mother, because if we take care of mother effectively, we will better support her in helping protect her own fetus. So repeat the head CT as you need for stability. And at the end of this talk, I'll talk a little bit about neuroimaging in general in the pregnant patient, because um, this, this is understandably a frequent area of concern. Repeat that head CT as you need to for stability, for neuro exam changes, et cetera. Of course, we're gonna shield the fetus as we do this. Still do that CTA to evaluate for an underlying vascular malformation. Now, if the bleed is small, the patient is stable, and you can wait for a time of flight MRA, by all means, consider that. That is safer than a CTA. However, oftentimes that's not actually legitimately an option. And so do your CTA, get your data, know what you're dealing with so that you can confidently treat her right. Um, monitor for signs of elevated ICP just as you would with any other um, individual and know that if ICP crises are encountered, mannitol has been reported to be safely given without harmful fetal effects. Take care of mom, let her take care of the fetus. And if seizures are encountered, do treat them aggressively, bearing in mind that a seizure decreases placental um, uh, perfusion during the time of, of active convulsions. So treat them aggressively, try to prevent them whenever we are able. What about arterial ve uh, venous malformations in pregnancy? There's actually mixed data on the rate of rupture during pregnancy. We do have a few studies that suggest that um, uh, rupture rates might be higher in pregnancy. So there's one study that showed um, a 5% uh, or almost 6% um, chance of hemorrhage in a pregnant patient um, compared to 1% um, in a non-pregnant patient. Um, a second uh, study using inpatient databases, so large data um, from California, Florida, and New York suggests a threefold increased rate of rupture. And yet there are multiple other studies that show no increase risk. So the reality is we don't really know. Maybe AVMs are slightly more likely to occur in pregnancy. And again, it, oh, sorry. Um, if you remember that first chart, if they rupture, they do seem to rupture perhaps a little earlier on in pregnancy, maybe in that second trimester. Um, similarly, there's no consensus regarding the elective treatment of unruptured AVMs prior to pregnancy, right? So um, probably the best study that we have looking at this is the Aruba trial, which suggests the medical management, um, non-surgical management, is superior to um, to well, non <laughs> medical management is superior to surgical management of ABMs, um, just kind of 
generally speaking, of course, we've probably all heard these debates about, you know, maybe there's bias in which patients were enrolled, et cetera, because not all um, uh, physicians believe in equipoise regarding this topic, um, despite the fact that we don't have much um, data to guide us one way or another. So if you're seeing a woman who has an AVM and is thinking about getting pregnant, it's going to be just a very um, intense conversation with a lot of counseling between yourself, her, maybe nurse surgery, um, or the interventionalist on, on do we want to do anything about this or, or, or take our chances. Treatment of a ruptured AVM during pregnancy, however, should be treated as any other non-pregnant patient, meaning if you need to um, do a conventional angiogram to embolize the AVM, do it. If you need to take her to surgery um, to, to, um, to resect the AVM and you think that's going to be um, in her best interest, do it. Do not delay treatment of a ruptured AVM in a pregnant patient. Take care of mom, she will take care of fetus. Similarly, there's no clear guidelines on delivery method in uh, unruptured uh, AVMs. Vaginal delivery, there are reports of it being safe. However, studies are very limited, quite honestly, just due to the frequency with which C-sections are under, um, undertaken in this population. It does seem that the majority of people probably opt for C-section, but there's not data to really kind of force that to be the, the decision point. Cerebral aneurysms. Um, a group out of US, uh, US, excuse me, a group out of UCSD did a systematic review of the literature looking at the role that pregnancy and female sex um, hormones play on uh, the development actually of cerebral aneurysm formation as well as the rupture. Um, and these included both epidemiologic studies as well as interventional studies using animal and um, cell models. And they found really a similar risk of aneurysmal rupture rate um, compared to um, the general population, if rupture does occur, it tends to happen in the third um, trimester. And um, in this particular study too, um, uh, C-section was also the most common mode of um, delivery. If an aneurysm does rupture, the treatment is the same as in the non-pregnant um, patient, bearing in mind um, that, again, protections may need to be um, undertaken to protect the fetus from radiation. Um, however, do not delay securing that aneurysm. Again, do the cerebral angiogram with embolization if you need to. If surgical resection is your only option, go for that as well. Um, and um, I want you to just be aware, too, that nemotipine is safe um, during pregnancy. And, can, and should still be given in an aneurysmal rupture. What about cerebral cavernous malformations? The only um, real data that I was able to find about um, treatment of CCM and, and kind of what happens um, in, in a pregnant individual came out of the Barrow Neurological Institute Natural History Study. Um, and uh, this natural history study included um, 168 pregnancies and 64 um, female patients who had CCM. Um, and the breakdown here on the cause of their CCM is listed. And there appeared to be about a 3% risk of symptomatic hemorrhage um, per per pregnancy. So not a high risk, not a zero risk, um, but, but not a high risk. 19 um, of these, uh, uh, 19 of these 168 pregnancies were delivered uh, via C-section with almost half of them actually being um, cited as a uh, fear of possible hemorrhage is the reason why um, C-section was pursued. However, the vast majority, 149 um, individuals did um, deliver vaginally and there seemed to be no complications associated um, with delivery. So in CCMs, I think we can confidently say vaginal delivery appears to be fine. We don't have to worry about pushing um, increase in the likelihood that someone's going to hemorrhage um, due to a CCM. Ischemic stroke. This is my favorite part. <laughs> so um, a few causes of ischemic stroke in pregnant women um, are, are listed here. Um, and, and these are um, obviously in addition to the more typical causes that can be seen uh, in the elderly population. But, but again, um, causes of stroke in the young and especially pregnancy related um, ischemic stroke um, does tend to be perhaps a little bit more varied and interesting um, in its etiology. Um, the risk of many of these diseases increases in the pregnant woman due to increased incidence of um, things like arterial di um, dissection. And um, this is related to alterations in elasticity um, and potentially um, even related to valsalvaine um, during labor. <clears throat> labor. Um, 
Similarly, excuse me, um, <clears throat> Similarly, um, risk of paradoxical embolus may actually increase in the pregnant patient even compared to um, the stroke in the young um, as a general uh, population. And that might be related to alterations in preload as well as hypercoagulability um, might, might lead to increased risk of, of clot formation elsewhere um, and, and contributing then to a paradoxical embolus. And exceptionally rare, but still known to occur um, occasionally, rarely, um, are paradoxical embolisms at the time of delivery due to an amniotic um, fluid embolus. Um, as previously discussed, press and RCVS uh, also increase the risk of is uh, ischemic stroke. Um, cerebral venous thrombosis can uh, increase the risk. Cardiomyopathy is, is certainly a known complication of pregnancy. We're not delving into that. We'll let cardiology deal with that. However, that cardiomyopathy may still um, contribute to the risk of stroke in, our, in a pregnant individual. And then, of course, we already know that eclampsia and preeclampsia um, contribute to risk of stroke pretty significantly. So how do we treat these individuals? Let's say that they're coming into us um, actually within the, the time window to be considered for acute intervention. Do we give them TPA? Do we consider mechanical thrombectomy? Let, let, let's talk about this. So in truth, no matter the underlying cause of the ischemic stroke, um, stroke our initial evaluation um, and management remains the same for all of the various etiologies, whether the patient's pregnant or non-pregnant. Um, and of course, one of the first tough decisions we may be forced to make is whether or not we're gonna treat with TPA or pursue mechanical thrombectomy. Understandably, given the rarity of the disease and the truthful disinclination, how about, um, that many investigators have, and including pregnant women in their studies, there's not a lot of data to guide us on the safety of these treatments in pregnant women. However, there was a study um, that used Get With the Guidelines registry data to try to gain some insight, and they um, evaluated um, all of the entries put into Get With the Guidelines registry over a five-year period. And over this five-year period, there was um, a little over 24,000 women of childbearing age who were diagnosed with stroke. And of those 24,000 women, 338 of them were either pregnant or in that first six weeks postpartum period. Of the 24,000 um, individuals, 2,500 of them uh, received acute reperfusion therapy, whether that be TPA or thrombectomy. So about 10, a little over 10% of them. Of the um, pregnant uh, individuals, a little over 11% of them received acute um, reperfusion uh, therapy. So pretty similar statistics on overall proportions that are receiving acute um, reperfusion therapy. Um, there was no statistical difference between those two groups. When you look at the use of TPA on its own, so without mechanical thrombectomy, however, there actually was a, a, a difference in that the um, pregnant individuals were less likely to receive TPA monotherapy. And the reasons that were most often cited for why TPA was not given was actually pregnancy as itself and or recent surgery. Maybe she just had a C-section, right? Um, it's worth noting that symptomatic ICH after TPA, when it was given, was actually almost, so not statistically um, significant, but, but almost a strong trend. Um, it, it may have been higher um, risk or rates of symptomatic hemorrhage after um, TPA in the pregnant patient compared to the non-pregnant patient. However, the caveat here is that the pregnant women tended to have a higher NIH stroke scale of 13 compared to nine in the non-pregnant individuals. Um, and we do know that the risk of hemorrhage increases with um, increasing NIH stroke scale. Um, and so there's probably true reasons outside of pregnancy on why that um, why the rates of symptomatic hemorrhage um, are going to be a little bit higher. Notably, there are no cases of major systemic bleeding in any of these individuals um, or in hospital death in the, in the pregnant or early postpartum um, individuals. And in both groups had similar rates of discharge to home. I also want you to be aware that if you are in the situation where you're having to um, uh, consider TPA, um, that it does seem to be safe um, to the fetus itself as TPA is such a large molecule, it actually doesn't cross the placenta. I think the take home and the consensus statement is that truly, if you're encountering a pregnant woman um, who is having a, a, a stroke, honestly, I think you can consider TPA, especially if it's going to be a moderate or severe um, infarct that's going to leave her with a lot of disability. 
it's going to, of course, be a, a pretty firm risks and benefits conversation. Um, but but I personally would would lean towards recommending it. What about tenecteplase? Right, as, as more and more institutions are making this transition away from um, TPA and over to tenecteplase for a lot of um, for a lot of logistical reasons, um, I, I unfortunately can't comment too much because really pregnant and postpartum women were not included in the acute ischemic trial, um, stroke trials looking at the use of tenecteplase. However, we do know that tenecteplase um, in the general population carries similar um, risk profiles compared to that of um, TPA. And it is also a large molecular weight um, molecule that does not cross the placenta. So again, should be safe um, for um, the fetus if you're having to make this decision. And I would probably um, have similar considerations uh, compared to that um, with TPA. So what do the guidelines say? Um, the 2018 AHA ASA guidelines for the early management of patients with acute ischemic stroke um, in pregnancy, they comment that IV alteplase administration may be considered in pregnancy with the anticipated benefits of treating moderate or severe stroke outweigh the anticipated increased risks of uterine bleeding. Um, I'll tell you, I've never had an obstetrician ever tell me like, no, don't do something because it's going to like cause increased bleeding. Um, they always say, we'll take care of that. You, you help me treat the patient. Um, the uh, guidelines also comment that the safety and efficacy of IV alteplase in the early postpartum periods so of less than 14 days after delivery have not been well established. We don't know those risks. In terms of dural puncture, let's say the, um, the woman recently delivered, she had an epidural um, placed as part of her pregnancy. The guidelines comment that IV alteplase or TPA uh, may be considered for individuals who, who present with acute ischemic stroke, even in instances when they may have undergone a lumbar puncture in the preceding seven days. So again, consider it if um, the patient's having a moderate or severe um, stroke. Um, what about thrombolysis in that very early um, postpartum period? The best I can give you is a systematic review of 13 cases that gave um, systemic TPA in really either the hours prior to delivery or up to 48 hours after. Um, and for most of these, the indication that TPA was given was cardiac. It was cardiac um, collapse most often due to PE. There was one case of cardiac collapse due to an amniotic fluid embolism. And of these 13 individuals, only one had an ischemic stroke. So not classically our, um, our population. And yet, if we're going to be assessing just general safety, I think we can still use this as at least some data. Um, so five of these cases delivered vaginally, eight um, were delivered uh, via cesarean section. Blood transfusions were um, necessary in all 13 cases. So you absolutely will see some bleeding um, as a consequence of giving TPA in this um, very um, close um, peripartum period. Um, Unfortunately, laparotomy was required to control bleeding in five of these individuals, all of whom had had cesarean sections, and three of them required a hysterectomy. There were notably no maternal deaths. I think the take home is that TPA in this period carries significant risk, um, especially perhaps if the individual delivered via C-section. And while I would still consider TPA, especially in severe stroke, I'd very seriously counsel the individual, the obstetrician, and their family about the increased risk of bleeding and the fact that it could potentially require another surgery and hysterectomy could potentially be needed as well. Um, make sure your obstetricians, they're helping you with these conversations. <laughs> what about mechanical thrombectomy? There are multiple case reports that suggest the safety of good maternal, um, that ex uh, sorry, there are multiple um, case reports commenting on safety with good maternal and fetal outcomes. However, our guidelines in the United States do not comment on the use, um, on, on its use in pregnant patients. And the best we really can do is look to our neighbors to the North. And so the Canadian um, guidelines comment that pregnancy should not be considered a contraindication for angiography and endovascular therapy for proximal large vessel occlusions causing acute disabling stroke. These cases should um, be treated according to existing guidelines. Treat them the same as you're going to any other patient. Of course, effort should be taken to protect um, the fetus from additional injuries. And so these protections are gonna include abdominal sh um, shielding and judicious use of X-ray um, exposure and maybe even contrast agents um, as, as reasonable. Um, they add that it is not reasonable to delay or defer necessary maternal care for severe disabling strokes secondary to pregnancy um, with the acknowledgement that um, possible fetal risks um, are appropriate, right? Have this conversation ahead of time with, with the 
patient, the family, whoever is, is able to understand. Um, and so these risks are going to include radiation, contrast exposure, potentially um, infections, arterial puncture complications, et cetera. However, given the very high mor uh, morbidity and mortality associated with acute ischemic stroke due to an LVO, these risks are generally outweighed by the benefits of treatment. And they um, follow up that patients with LVOs who are eligible for um, and with rapid access to endovascular thrombectomy, it's reasonable to actually consider proceeding directly to th uh, endovascular uh, thrombectomy without giving TPA ahead of time. Um, and so again, that might be a, a, another tool in your tool belt that if you have someone who's coming in with a high NIH stroke scale, so probably does carry slightly increased risk of symptomatic hemorrhage if we give them TPA, um, may and you can just as quickly get them to the thrombectomy suite as you can to um, give them TPA. You might want to consider bypassing TPA in this particular patient population. What about um, delivery? Um, after a pregnancy-related stroke, let's say a, a woman has um, had a stroke during her pregnancy, and now we're talking about delivery, the reality is the timing of delivery should be guided by the severity of the mother's medical condition as well as fetal stability. Um, and that's going to really come down to a very intense conversation with the obstetrician because they're going to know that that judgment better than us. Um, but be aware that there is no contraindication to vaginal um, delivery, and unless, of course, if she um, maybe had an ICH or something like that um, that's causing like a, um, a mass effect within the brain, you probably wouldn't want her um, pushing during those circumstances. But assuming that there's not a large um, a large amount of edema or other um, reason to suspect ICP issues, vaginal delivery should be safe. Secondary stroke um, prevention. Um, the take home here is that aspirin's probably safe. There are some, um, some reports that are not consistently um, held up in subsequent studies, but, but some reports of maybe fetal malformations um, in those early um, weeks of gestation, so prior to 11 weeks gestation. However, given the fact that most of our patients, if they're having stroke, are doing so um, really in the third trimester or the postpartum period, um, aspirin is probably safe. And, and I'm sure we've all encountered um, OB putting patients on aspirin for various uses, including um, there's trials looking at the use of aspirin for prevention of preeclampsia. Um, and a coagulation, also safe if that's what's necessary. However, you have to be mindful about the medications you're choosing. So as a reminder, warfarin is frankly contraindicated um, in a pregnant individual due to the high risk of teratogenicity um, and, and fetal hemorrhage. Um, unfractionated heparin and low molecular weight heparin is safe um, as it does not cross the placenta. And again, as I mentioned earlier, DOAX um, really are, 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 are meant to be avoided during pregnancy as there is some evidence that they cross um, the placenta. What about um, if you're seeing a woman uh, come in with um, a prior history of pre um, pregnancy-related stroke, and she's, she's wanting to know what is the likelihood that she's going to have a recurrent stroke? I found one study kind of addressing uh, this particular issue, and it was a multi-centered study out of France, and they surveyed 441 women of childbearing age with a prior history of stroke. <clears throat> and these um, individuals were either were, were stroke kind of regardless of whether or not she was pregnant. So 40, uh, 441 uh, women, um, prior history of stroke. And of those 441 women, the vast majority had a prior history of just a run-of-the-mill arterial ischemic stroke. Only 7% of those had occurred in the setting of prior pregnancy or perperium, so that six-week postpartum um, period. 68 of the um, 441 women, uh, their uh, prior history of stroke was actually a, a cerebral venous thrombosis. These women were followed for a mean time frame of five years, and there were a total of 187 pregnancies in 125 of the women. And of those um, 187 pregnancies, there were 13 recurrent strokes. Two of those 13 were associated um, with pregnancy. However, for both of them, they had a thrombophilia. Um, so one of them had an phospholipid antibody syndrome, and one had essential thrombocythemia. Of those 13 um, strokes, 12 of them, again, run-of-the-mill recurrent um, arterial ischemic strokes, and one was a CVT. So the overall rate of recurrent um, infarct in a pregnant uh, woman is overall really quite low. Um, that risk is going to be higher if there's an associated um, thrombophilia uh, separate from the pregnant state. 
Um, the overall uh, rate of recurrence was only 1% within one year, and over the total 5% or the total five year period um, was 2.3%. And this was without regard to pregnancy. And so those um, statistics are even lower in the pregnant women. And no woman with a prior pregnancy related stroke had a recurrent stroke during pregnancy. So again, this can potentially be hopefully reassuring to those individuals who had a stroke with their prior pregnancy. I told you we'd talk a little bit about imaging um, considerations um, since we do rely so much on um, neuroimaging as we're talking about all of these diagnoses. Um, and, and really, I think there's a few considerations to be aware of. Um, in terms of um, exposure to harmful things, whether that be radiation or potentially contrast, uh, the, the highest risk is actually the pre-implantation embryo because they're going to be the most sensitive to radiation. However, the likelihood that this is going to cause a long-term effect um, to ultimately the fetus and the infant is essentially zero. The reason being that the reaction to the embryo to radiation is really an all or none um, phenomena. These, um, uh, the, 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 there's, the, the embryo is so early in its growth in this pre-implantation pre um, phase that it's truly still just fully pluripotent. And the um, embryo is either going to repair itself from the injury received from um, radiation. And if it repairs itself, it's either, it's gonna do it fully or it's going to say, this is more than I can handle, and it's frankly going to abort. So there have been no um, reports of teratogenesis um, observed in pregnancies who have been exposed to radiation in, this, in, in the first week of pregnancy. Um, the highest risk of actually contributing to injury um, down the line that, that, that might persist is actually the time period of organogenesis, which happens during um, gestational weeks of um, three to 10, because these are this is really the time period that's most critical for preventing mental and growth retardation effects. And microcephaly has been reported due to a consequence of radiation exposure at this state in pregnancy. When we're talking about cerebrovascular events, though, be mindful that most of these events are occurring much later in pregnancy. And, um, and while we will absolutely take every effort that we can to prevent um, harmful effects to the fetus, um, those risks are overall, especially in this current day and age, um, relatively low. What about CT in particular? Because of course, this is probably what we fear the most. Um, the overall amount of um, Ionize, exposure to ionizing radiation in the fetus and routine non-contrasted head CT is actually pretty low. There are higher exposures um, if you're doing a CTA um, or, a, or a CT perfusion. Um, however, when clinically indicated without the option realistically of, um, of, of doing alternative methods, we should still absolutely be doing this imaging. You're of course gonna take um, uh, protective measures are going to shield the fetus as, as much as you can. You might um, try to minimize um, the amount of radiation. Um, you might be, give a lower dose of contrast, et cetera. Take care of the patient. She'll take, um, she'll take care of the fetus. And then what about the iodinated contrast that we give for um, CTA? We obviously are giving it for a CT perfusion as well. And it's actually the same contrast that we give for conventional angiograms. Um, do you know it crosses the placenta? And there are reports of transient effects on the, feta, um, on the fetal thyroid function um, as a consequence of exposure to iodinated contrast. However, as long as these are just brief exposures, like really only in this acute period, um, the, the um, clinical sequelae don't seem to be significant if, if, if they exist at all. And overall, it's really just gonna come down to a risks and benefits um, conversation and, and exposing um, the mother and the fetus to just the minimal amount of contrast that's, uh, that's actually needed. The take home is contrast in CTs is not actually contraindicated. What about your breastfeeding patients? Since we're kind of thinking about this population in general, um, I think it's important to know that less than 1% of contrast dye is excreted in breast milk and less than 1% of that um, excretion is actually absorbed by the GI tract. And so there is no need to pump and dump after a contrasted CT. Um, MRI. I think we probably all know MRI itself is safe. However, gadolinium does cross the placenta and it is known to deposit in fetal tissue. And so it is frankly contraindicated. Do not give gadolinium to the pregnant patient. I'm sure radiology is going to stop you if you ever try to do that. 
Final comments, seizure, um, obviously not a cerebral vascular effect, but may be consequent of one. Um, do not assume that any new seizure in a pregnant patient is due to eclampsia. Always do rapid neuroimaging to evaluate for alternative causes. As we have just discussed, seizure can be seen in many of these cerebral vascular events. Um, and so make sure that we are aware of the full picture of what is contributing to that clinical presentation of the patient. So in conclusion, um, pregnancy and the proprium carry increased risk of ischemic hemorrhagic and venous stroke. Preeclampsia is a significant risk factor for both ischemic and hemorrhagic stroke. And the risk of stroke is actually greatest in the postpartum period followed by the third trimester. Risk of stroke increases due to a combination of systemic hemodynamic changes, vascular and connective uh, tissue changes and alterations in the coagulation cascade. And treatment of cerebrovascular complications associated with pregnancy is generally the same as in the pregnant patient. And there might be some possible minor exceptions, such as um, your blood pressure agent of choice, or maybe your anticoagulation um, agent of choice. But overall, what is good for the mother is good for the fetus. And C-section uh, delivery is often recommended in cases of AVM and aneurysms, though it has not been formally studied. And with that, I am done. Um, I'd welcome any uh, questions. This is actually a picture of my um, two children looking out um, over our um, over our yard and, and over the Puget Sound, which is obscured by the beautiful sunset that we were observing that day. That was great. A uh, very thorough dive into something we often don't get enough of in residency. Um, I have one quick question for you. Uh, one of the earlier slides talked about increased risk of these sorts of complications with advancing maternal age. Uh, and in the very young pregnant patient, there's a lot of pregnancy related complications that are more common. Is there any evidence that in the like child pregnancy that any of the cerebrovascular complications are more common? Not that I am aware of though, though um, in truth, I don't know that really any studies are, are looking at those very young um, pregnant individuals. Um, so my guess is our lack of knowledge could entirely likely be due to lack of studies um, rather than, than lack of actually safety. So I would like to thank everyone here for joining us today. Uh, Dr. Weber, thank you for joining us as a moderator. And of course, Dr. Weather, thank you so much for the information. I have just posted in the chat that this uh, webinar will be recorded and posted on YouTube. We will announce that when that happens. Uh, if you wish to look up for any other upcoming topics, you are welcome to look on the AAN website where we have the virtual resident education lecture series posted. Thank you everyone for joining. Uh, we will see you next month.